All right. Um, I actually had um, a student after class, uh, I think it was on Thursday, um, asked me something. And then I had um, a same student ask almost the same question in the online class. So I thought, well, it'd be a good thing to talk about. And so we'll start class with that discussion today. And the discussion surrounds the sort of the difference between the way I've described normalization and the way the textbook describes normalization. All right. Um, the idea is, is, is normalization is sort of a means to a goal. All right. It's the approach that you take to get somewhere. And you can describe that route a couple different ways. And it's my belief that that's why I don't do exactly this in the book. Uh, in my mind, it's better that for you to see a couple different viewpoints on the issue and a couple different approaches. And hopefully that will make it more meaningful for you. But again, some folks had some questions on it. So we will go over the approach the textbook takes. Before we do that, though, remember I said that um, normalization is a means to a goal. Well, what is our goal? Let's make sure we're, we're absolutely clear on that. Our goal is All right, that thing ain't working. I'll do this instead. That one wasn't my fault. That one does not count against my score of having the wrong thing on. Our goal is threefold. Number one, to make sure we've identified all the entities. Number two, to make sure we've identified the relationships. And number three, make sure we've identified attributes and associated with the proper entity. Now, depending on how you're given the data, you can apply these steps in different ways. Sometimes you're given the data in the form of a narrative. In other words, that's what I've done in several examples. I've described the problem to you. All right, I've said we have a clinic and there's so many doctors in the clinic and so on. That's one way that you can be given the data. Another way that you can be given the data is you can be given essentially like a spreadsheet or a set of uh, an Excel worksheet or, or some tables like that and you have to go and you have to normalize it. So you can be given the data, the, the data in a variety of different formats that's why, in my mind, it's good to have sort of a di couple different views uh, on this. The examples in the textbook, specifically the ones that we're being asked about, related to where you have a table of data. And for this, again, I don't know why the projector isn't working. No. No. Um, I'll go and I'll, I'll open up Excel. And I'll put in the prescription example then. <coughs> All right. Uh, if you do have your textbook, this is on page, the bottom of page 68. And they have a table that looks like this. They have a prescription number. They have a date. They have a drug, they have a dosage, they have a customer name, they have a customer phone, and finally they have a customer email. All right. All right. That's the the fields they have in, and they have something like prescription number one was issued 10-1-2011. The drug is for drug A. The dosage is 100 milligrams. Um, P 
Pete Smith. And yeah, something like that. All right, that looks like a good size to see. Um, so, what the textbook says, the normalization process for this, and this is, this is one way that you can be given the data. You could be given the data like this, essentially in a worksheet, all right, or a spreadsheet. And they say the normalization problem is first, uh, the normalization process, and I'm looking in the middle of page 68, says to first of all identify all the candidate keys of a relation. Now, what's a candidate key? Pardon me? Well, not exactly. It identifies a row or something? Yeah. A primary key is a field or set of fields that could be the primary key. And what could be the primary key? Well, it needs to uniquely identify a row. It needs to identify a member of that relation, a row in that relation. Um, what are the requirements for a primary key again? It has to be uh, unique. So there's no, no two of them can have the same value. Every member of that relation has to have a value for it. All right. And I think that's it. Unless there's a third part. I thought there was a third part. Okay. Y unique. And, and no, I think that's it. So it's possible that you could have a table or a relation where there's two things that could qualify as primary key. All right. For example, in an employee table. In an employee table, the employee number could be the primary key or the social security number could be the primary key. All right. It's candidates. It's like candidates running for an election. You know, before, you, before one of them selected, either one of them could ultimately be mayor or governor or whatever. All right. So they're candidates to be primary key. All right, think of it that way. Um, you choose one. How do you choose one? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, you choose based on length. In other words, it's better to have a shorter key than a longer key. You choose it based on data type. That is, numbers typically take less space than characters, so you probably want a numeric field. Um, you don't necessarily want fields that change often as well. So something that doesn't change, something that's numeric, and something that's short will probably take precedence over something that's long, something that's alphanumeric, and something that changes frequently. All right. There might be some other special considerations too, like for example, social security number is sort of a sensitive piece of data. So you wouldn't necessarily want to be slinging that around in a lot of different places. All right. So because of that, you know, in, in, in that example, employee number probably would be a better choice than social security number. Um, here at LC, every one of you has an email address at LC. Did you know that? All right, you do. <laughs> uh, now, you also have your student number, which could be primary key. Both could, right? Either one, or l let me rephrase that, not both could, either one could. Because every student has an email address assigned by learning community. And it's unique, all right? Everyone also has a student number assigned from learning community, and that's unique as well. But my guess is that in most cases, they, or, or not in most cases, but in this case and in most similar cases, you would take the student number because the student number, again, is numeric, takes up less space, and so on and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So the question in this example is, what is the primary key? What is what could we use to uniquely identify a prescription? Well, this is pretty straightforward, right? The prescription number. The, pre the prescription number is the only candidate. All right? So this is like one of those elections where you go in the voting booth and there's only one person run for mayor. All right? Only one candidate, easy choice. All right? Sometimes I still won't vote for them if there's only one candidate. I don't know, just if I'm feeling ornery. You know, <laughs> but anyhow, that's neither here nor there. 
All right. There's only one candidate in this case, prescription number. And we could analyze it, but I think we'll, we'll determine that that's the case. You know, we know, for example, that name couldn't be the uh, primary key, right? Because a person could have more than one prescription. What's more, there could be two people with the same name, all right? In addition, phone number couldn't be primary key, right? Because, for example, me and my wife, me and my daughter would have the same phone number listed there. And, and therefore, we each could have different prescriptions. Customer email address couldn't be the primary key either because a customer could have several prescriptions. All right? Even if you say that every customer has an email address, which I think is the assumption in this example, and that it's unique. Even if we assume that, then you couldn't use it as a primary key for the prescription table because um, a person could have more than one, pre one prescription. So really, the only candidate key is a prescription number. So I'm going to go in and we'll follow these steps. This is the prescription table, prescription relation they call it, or soon to be the prescription table. Now, so the answer to part one is the candidate key, the only candidate key is the prescription number. All right. The next part is probably the trickiest part in their examples, and that's where they ask for the functional dependencies. All right. What that is, is you look at everything that isn't the key here, all right, because the key is sort of exempt from this, but you look at everything that's not a key, and you find out what the dependencies are. What do I mean by dependency? Probably a simple way to describe dependency is what's the most fundamental thing that you need to know to know the value of an attribute? For example, if we look at this one, what do we need to know to know the customer name for a prescription? What do we need to know to know a customer name? What's the most fundamental thing that we need to know? Do we have to know what prescription that you're talking about to know a customer's name? No. All right. If I simply know the customer's email address, I could tell you that customer's name. So one example of a dependency would be that the customer email determines the customer name and the phone number. So that's an example, that, that's a determinant, uh, a dependency. So when you're assessing these, you're finding out what you absolutely have to know in order to know the values of some of these attributes. We went over examples similar to this uh, previously when we talked about, um, I wouldn't store for every student the number of credit hours that this class is for, right? Because the student doesn't determine how many credit hours this class is for. This class is for three credit hours, it's for three credit hours for every single student. All right? So therefore, I don't need to know the student ID to know how many credit hours this class are for, uh, is for. All right? I need to know the class ID or the course number or whatever that primary key is. Same idea here. I don't need to know what prescription we're talking about to know the name of the customer. If I know the customer's email address, I know the name of the customer that we're talking about. In this example, and I don't particularly like it, uh, but in this example, the assumption is that the customer email will be the identifying column for uh, a customer. All right? Okay. So what you want to do in this case is, is go through for each one of these and determine that and, and find that dependency. 
All right? The date. What do we have to know to know the date? Yeah. In other words, here, I'm going to document the dependencies here. And the way they'd write it would be like this. Prescription number determines the date. In other words, if I know the prescription number, I know the date of the prescription. It's sort of common sense, right? But this is a systematic way of, of a systematic approach of doing this. Would any of the other things serve as a determinant? If I know the drug, would that tell me the prescription date? No. You prescribe any drug on any day, right? If I know the customer, does that determine the prescription date? No. Customer could have several different prescriptions, each for different dates. All right? But if I know the prescription number, then I can tell you the date. Yes? If you know the prescription number, you know all of it. Well, good point. The, the, the statement was, if you know the prescription number, you know all of it. All right? That's true. But do I need to know the prescription number to know the customer's name? No. That's where it comes in. This is where, in my terms, I call it, uh, uh, it's called a transitive dependency. You're right. You could go from the prescription number to the name of the customer, but that doesn't mean that there's a dependency because there's sort of an extra step in there. Actually, you know the prescription number, so you know the customer's email for that prescription, and the customer's email will tell you the customer's name. So really, when it comes down to like the most fundamental thing you need to know to know the value of the field, you're right. In a roundabout way, if you know the prescription ID, you can get to the customer name. But the most fundamental way to get to the customer name is if you know the customer email, then, oh, that's why it's Outlook's coming up. That's an email address. If you know a customer's email, then you know their information. So that's a good point. And that's a little bit subtle. Um, but, again, think of it in terms of like the most fundamental thing you need to know. All right? Does prescription number determine the drug? Yeah. What else would determine the drug? Does the date determine the drug? No. Does the customer determine the drug? No. None of that makes sense but the prescription. If I know the prescription, I know the drug that is in that prescription. What about dosage? They make this suggestion. Does drug determine dosage? Yes or no? No. no. Why not? Go ahead. Right. A different, uh, uh, a different prescription for the same drug could have a different dosage. You know, you're not going to give me, you know, if, if I was prescribed, uh, you know, uh, Tylenol three. You know, you're not going to give me the same prescription as you give to, you know, someone, some, you know, some person that weighed 100 pounds, right? You know, you're going to give me a higher dosage because I'm bigger. All right. Um, or if a more severe injury, you might give uh, more of a particular prescription or whatever, all right? But if I know the drug, I don't automatically know the dosage because not everyone is prescribed the same medication in the same amount, all right? If I know the customer, do I know the dosage? No. In other words, you don't take 100 milligrams regardless of the drug that you're taking, all right? That sounds pretty dangerous, right? So if I know the prescription, I know the dosage. Now, whoops. here's what you were getting uh, to before. Can you say, if I know the prescription, I know the customer name? Yes, but that's indirect. In other words, the real dependency is to say, in this case, the 
customer email determines the customer name and the customer phone. In other words, another way to look at it is if there were two different prescriptions for the same customer, they should have the same phone and the same name associated with it. So if there were duplicates, two prescriptions for this customer, then those should match up. Shouldn't matter which prescription you look at. In that regard, then, it's not really that the prescription determines the customer, it's the customer's email determines. In other words, if I know the customer email, whether I know it, whether they have any prescriptions or not, if I know the customer's email, I know their name and their address. So, in terms of dependency, that would look like this. All right. Now, this might also be a little confusing, but bear with me. If I know the, pre what do I need to know to know which customer is getting that prescription? I need to know the prescription ID. So the customer's email is determined by the prescription ID. In other words, if I know the prescription ID, I know the customer's email. Another way to say that is, is we have to connect the prescription with the customer somehow, right? And what we're doing here, and what, or what we're eventually going to do with this, is we're going to make that customer email the key to its own table, and we're going to make a foreign key to that. All right? So, what we do then, all right, now that we've determined the dependencies, what we do is we sort of go through here and we say, I'm going to copy this down here. This is step three. All right, in step three, we go and we use the information that we determine in step two to break this stuff down into its own tables. So watch what it says step three. We place the columns of the functional dependency in a, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I skipped a part. Examine the determinants of the functional dependencies. If any determinant is not a candidate key, the relation is not well formed. I think the way I put that is every attribute in a table should be determined by the key and only by the key. So if there's something in this table that's determined by something other than the key, you got a problem. It's not a good relation and you need to break it out. What do you do? You break out those columns that are determined by something else. So in this case, these three columns are determined by something else. And you put them in a table of their own. And what do you make as a primary key? You make the primary key whatever that determinant was. I think somehow I got rid of name there. So you pull those out of that table. You leave a copy of the determinant in the original table. Why do we do that? Why do we leave a copy of that determinant in the original table? Yeah, it's the foreign key. We still have to show that relationship. 
there still is a relationship between customer and prescription. Therefore, we have to have the prescription point to the customer. However, again, as I said before, and again, this is another way that maybe I phrase it a little bit differently, but the concept was the same. The only thing that should link tables together is that foreign key, whereas a foreign key in one table that points to the primary key of another table. So that's what they mean by saying you keep, you keep the determinant in the original table and you make a new table with uh, the, the, the determinant as the primary key. And then you create referential integrity. That is, you create a foreign key relationship between those two. So you'd create a foreign key where the customer email in the customer or the customer email in the prescription table would have to match up the customer email in the customer table. Now, and, and then you repeat until you've, you've taken care of everything because you could have a relation with a lot of different stuff. This process is useful if you're presented the data in this form. Sort of the way that I've approached this in previous examples is I've looked and I've said, well, where do we have another entity here that isn't part of the prescription? Well, and, and even a textbook talks about this. We have actually two themes in this table, right? We have prescription information and customer information, and that's not good. Each table should only have one theme. So what do we do? Well, we take out the stuff that relates to the prescription, take out the stuff that relates to the customer and put it in its own table and link the two based on the foreign key. So either approach, you end up sort of with the same thing. Any questions on this? And if you look on page, top of page 70, they show the results of um, the normalization process. The one thing that I disagree with I don't disagree with, I would say in addition to that, I would also make a drug table because you don't want any old drug to be put in there. You want to constrain that to putting in only drugs that are, are actual drugs and you don't want any sort of inconsistency or whatever. Do we want to do the next example, 70? with students and dorms and all that. Let me discuss how I would do it and then we'll, we'll just briefly discuss how perhaps um, the textbook process would work. All right. I would look at that and say we're actually combining two entities together. In other words, we have a table whose foreign key, or whose primary key presumably is student number, because that identifies a student, and we have the dorm name and dorm cost in that table. Now, students don't pay different amounts if they're in the same dorm, right? A student in Stevens pays 3,500, a student in Alexander pays 3,800, a student in Horam pays 4,000. All right. So in other words, that would be what I would call a transitive dependency, going by the normalization rules I talked about last time. The amount for the, for the two, uh, not the tuition, but the dorm cost doesn't depend on the student. It depends on what dorm that they're in. So therefore, that dorm information needs to be in its own table. Now, we still need to keep the dorm name in there because the dorm name has to point to that dorm table to pick up the dorm cost and maybe other information about the dorm. All right. Now, the way the textbook would, would say this is they would look at this and say the, the primary key is uh, student number and they would go through the dependencies and when they got to the dorm cost, they would say the dorm cost fundamentally depends on the dorm that you're in. 
doesn't depend on the student that's in a particular dorm. It only depends on the dorm you're in. And therefore, that's a dependency that's not the primary key. So we would separate that out into its own table and would keep the determinant, which is the dorm name, as an attribute in the original table. So really two different paths, one based on sort of looking at it maybe more intuitively and understanding the purposes of making sure that we have identified all the entities, identified the attributes, and then, um, um, you know, coming out with the tables that way. If you do either one properly, you'll end up with, with, the, right, uh, with the right answer, if you, do, if you take either approach properly. Now, the, the, the thing is, and the reason why I talk about this a couple different ways, is you're not always given a neat spreadsheet of data like this. All right? It really depends on the situation. I have been given spreadsheets like this. I had to convert into a relational database. So that is a, a, a true scenario. All right? I've also, instead of being given like a spreadsheet that I had to go and complete, I also have been given um, just a narrative, a description, talk to people, in which case you end up sort of drawing the ERD and, and doing that. The bottom line is whatever approach that you take, when you're all done, you should be able to look at the normalization rules and make sure that the normalization rules hold. In other words, make sure that every column in a table depends only on the entire primary key. Doesn't depend on anything else. All right? Doesn't depend on part of the primary key. Doesn't depend on something that's not a key. All right? Now the one catch that they throw into this when they talk about candidate keys is they don't want you to get confused if you said, well, wait a minute, a person's name you could say depends on the employee number and the social security number. Well, those are both candidate keys, so that's okay. You know, a candidate key is, is, you know, can be considered just like a primary key when you're doing determinancy. All right, questions. What I'd like to do, and again, we can approach this from either perspective, is I would like to do a quick example together. And we can talk through it, um, and we can do it based on, someone forgot to log off of Google Docs. One of the reasons I shut the screen down for a second. I would like to go over an example of We'll start this example today. We'll see how far we get on it. And uh, if, if needed, we'll continue it on Thursday. All right. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about developing a um, database for movie showtimes, okay? Um, so this is an example again of where the information coming to you isn't in the form that they show in the textbook. In other words, I don't have a spreadsheet of these movie. I'm going to kind of give a narrative. Now, does that mean that we can't use a technique in the book? No. When we're all done, we can go in and we can apply and we can look at the determinants and make sure that none of the tables that we come out with um, violate any of the normalization rules. I often get questions like that. Like, if you're normalizing data, do you have to go and have to start at this point 
and then go through the normalization process. No, you take your best stab at what you think the correct tables are and then you go back and apply the normalization rules to see if, if any of them fall apart. And what I'll do in this example is we'll try to work through it correctly, but when we're done we'll check it against the normalization rules and we'll talk about maybe how things could have gone wrong. All right. Hopefully we'll do it without any mistakes, but if we do make some mistakes we'll talk about how, uh, you know, uh, how it could have gone wrong and how we would have corrected it. All right, so let's say that we're doing, all right, here's the rules that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about for this example. Let's say that we have movies, and movies can play in many theaters. All right, that's the first rule. All right, um, I can't even name any movies that are out now. Um, Star Wars, all right. Star Wars won't just be playing at Cobblestone, right? Star Wars will be playing at Cobblestone and at Crocker Park and at probably 500 other theaters across the country. All right. So one rule is that movies play in many theaters. Each movie has a rating. All right. So. A movie can't be R and PG, right? A movie is R or it's PG or it's PG-13 or G or whatever, all right? Each theater can have multiple showings for a movie. All right. So in other words, Star Wars could be playing at um, Cobblestone at you know noon, 3 p.m., 5 p.m., and 10 p.m. or something like that. So on a given day, there can be multiple showings of the same film. All right. Um, for simplicity in this example, we're going to assume that the schedule is the same every day. So in other words, there's no special Saturday showings or anything like that. that well, we can define just one showing, one showing schedule and it applies for every day until, you know, the next movie comes out and it changes or whatever. All right. We need to know the duration of a movie. Movies can have many actors. I think that's enough for now. All right. Um, let's create some entities here. And again, I, I uh, unfortunately I'm not able to um, draw on the little thingy. But we'll just we'll type in our tables and, and entities, and we'll talk about the relationships between them. Someone yell out a entity. Hello, testing. Theater. Theater. Okay. We're going to define our entities. First one we have is a theater. All right. What's another entity? Movie. Uh, so if we don't get movie, this is going to be a long night. All right. <laughs> Next one. Time. Pardon me? Time. A time. I'm going to call it a little bit different. Oh, we're going to call it a showing. All right. But, but a show time or showing or something like that. All right. And other entities. Mm hmm. And I think I see one more entity. We have theater. Pardon me? Um, we're not we're not really taking that into account for this one. Um, uh, again, we we could come up with something like that, like how many tickets are sold or whatever. But but we'll uh, we'll leave that that blank. What other entity do we have here? 
factors. Sure. Now, someone said duration. Remember, any piece of information you get can either be a new entity, a relationship, or an attribute. So, duration um, seems to me more like a attribute than an entity. Why? Because duration, you know, number of minutes the movie is. Um, are there a list of allowable lengths of movies? No. You know, movie can be, you know, any number of, of minutes, really. You know, there's some long ones, you know. Geez, the uh, Lord of the Rings go on for several days, if I'm not mistaken, those movies. So, there's really no, it's not like rating, right? Well, with ratings, there's only like four of them, right? It has to be one of those four. There aren't like four or ten or twenty different durations that are possible for a movie. There's virtually unlimited number of durations. So that sounds more like an attribute to me. All right. Let's go in and start filling in some of these attributes. And for each of these to start, I'm going to define a primary key of the table name ID. All right, so we'll do that to start. I really wish I had the drawing thing to draw an ERD for this. We might go back and do that next time. Let's start looking at some of these relationships between the entities. What's the relationship? Someone shout out a relationship. Theater can have many movies. Okay. Now, that's one half of the relationship. Theater can be at many movies. How many movies can, wait a minute, a theater can have many movies. How many theaters can a movie have? Many. All right. So you need to consider it going both ways. Again, let's look at Cobblestone and Star Wars. All right. Cobblestone, the theater down the street, right? There's what? 16 screens, something like that. Right. How many movies are playing at Cobblestone right now? A bunch of them. All right. I don't know that any of them. All right. But let's pretend. All right. I'll, I'll mention uh, movies I know and, and it, will, it will date me and it will tell you how old I am. All right. But Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, you know, uh, Stripes, uh, Lost in Translation. All those movies could be playing at that theater. All right? So, one theater can have many movies associated with it. All right? At Cobblestone Theater, right now, there's a bunch of movies playing. Now, Star Wars. Is Star Wars only at Cobblestone? Not likely. Star Wars could be at Cobblestone, I said, and, and Crocker Park and whatever. So the relationship between theater and movie is a many to many. What does that mean as far as entities? What do we have to do? Yeah, we have to create an intersecting table. Interestingly enough, we're going to see, I'll, I'll do a spoiler, as they say, that's going to end up being the showtime table, right? But right now, I'll say that we have a theater movie table whose primary key is theater ID 
plus movie ID. What's another relationship that we have here? Go ahead. Actors and movies. And what's that relationship? Many to many. Okay. So we know the drill. We need a movie actor table whose primary key is going to be the movie ID and actor ID. All right, another relationship. Rating and, and movie. And what's the nature of that relationship? Okay. One to many going in what direction? One rating can have how many movies? Many. One movie can have how many ratings? One. All right. So there's one to many, where rating can have many movies, but each movie only has one rating. So what do we put where? Do we put a, our two choices would seem to be, do we put a movie ID in the rating table, or do we put a rating ID in the movie table? Rating ID in the movie table, right? The movie can have, as an attribute, the one rating ID that belongs to that movie. You can't possibly stuff all the PG movies into one column in the rating table, right? So you couldn't have the movie ID as an attribute in the rating table. You could, however, have a rating ID as a foreign key in the movie table. All right, let's start filling in some attributes. Right now, I'll tell you right now, this one, we're going to come back to that. I doubt if we'll be able to wrap this part of it up today. We'll talk about this next time. But we can do some of these things. Let's start naming attributes that we would likely to have. And let's look at where we'd put them. Where are we going to put the title of the movie? In the movie, right? Let's say we mess that up and put the title of the movie here. All right. How would we catch that? Well, based on my description, this would be a violation of the second normalization rule. That is, the title depends on part of the key to this table, the movie ID. It doesn't depend on the theater. What they would say in the book is the determinant for movie title is the, the, the movie ID. It's not the theater and movie ID. You don't have to know the theater to know the name of this movie. All right. So title would belong here. Where would the actor name be? In the actor table. Where would the duration of the movie be? In the movie. Could we put the duration there? No. Then we're back to the same thing. It, Star Wars is, you know, two hours, five minutes. It's two hours, five minutes, regardless if you play it here or in the theater down the street. That movie has a certain duration. So therefore, the duration doesn't belong, doesn't have a different showing uh, length if you show it at um, one theater versus another. Using the terminology in the book, the determinant for the duration of the movie is simply the movie ID, is what movie you're talking about, not what movie and where you are showing it. All right? The name of the theater, I said like cobblestone. Well, that would be theater name. And so on. Under rating, you would probably have a description of the rating. All right. Now, this will be a cliffhanger. Since we're talking movies, I'm setting up the sequel that will happen on Thursday. All right. I mentioned and I alluded to the fact that these two are going to be ending up being the same table. All right. Between now and Thursday, see if you can think through why that's going to be. How does this table and this table end up really being the same thing? 
All right. What do I mean by that? If you can't think of it, don't worry about it. All right. It's not a test question or anything like that. But when we examine this, we're going to find really that those two are the same. Ultimately, are the same table. All right. Okay. We'll leave it at that. Next time we will finish this example up and we might have another example or we might um, uh, go over an access. One thing I will say, um, again, the, the part of the lecture, uh, the first part of this lecture uh, was based on the fact that, again, I had a student uh, in class ask me about it and I had an online student ask me about it. If there's something you want me to cover in class, whether you be in, in class or taking the online class, by all means ask me. You know, I can, um, you know, I can, I can work through a specific example or I can talk about something in access or I can talk about something in the book that might be confusing you. So again, normally my approach is to give my slant on the topic, but if you want me to cover something that's in the book, uh, by all means let me know and I'll be glad to do it. All right, see you over in lab. <laughs>